Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Hello there. Got an interesting guest coming to you next week, chatting with Sarah Schroeder, who's with One River's Digital Fund Trading Group, which was recently purchased by Coinbase. So lots to talk about there. On to this episode, we've got one of the true characters in our business and fellow Chicagoan, Totem Assets, Andrew Strasman. We dive into his background at Fame Chicago Trading Firm DRW, some of the cool trend focused indicators and tools he offers up to investors, and of course, all the nitty gritty on trend models, the trend fund industry, and even trend investors, as only Andrew can tell it. Send it. This episode is brought to you once again by RCM's newly released Managed Futures Rankings. Want to see who the best trend followers are, the best programs you can access with under 250K, the best overall, etc., etc. Go to rcmalts.com slash rankings and download it today. Now, back to the show. Hey, everybody. Here with Andrew Strasman. Do I ever pronounce that right? I don't think I just say, hey, you when I see you at conferences and stuff. <laughs> hey, pal. Hey, buddy. You know, that's yeah. that's good. That's good. Strasman. Yeah. Um, so let's start with for you listeners, head over to YouTube because Andrew's got a heck of a virtual background here. He's got some QR codes, some boarded up, uh, nice distressed logo look. So give us give us the breakdown of what's going on with the virtual background. Oh, that's um okay. So I've got a link in there for my LinkedIn. I mean it's pretty standard. Um, just my URL. Always be branding, right? Right. Jeff, always be branding. Um, and then there's um a QR code for the famous turtle quiz. I'm sure you're familiar. Yeah. 66 questions. Um, and it was the original true false entrance exam by Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart for the original turtle trading program. So I included that in there. What I did was um I took I took the original turtle exam and I want to just like put it online because you can find it, but you know, there's no answer key or anything like that. So um I put it online and I filled it in with my answers and I sent it to Jerry Parker, who's of course one of the original and most famous turtles. So he he comes back with a WTF. I only got like 93%. <laughs> And it's so you got like five questions wrong. And I'm like, Jerry, relax. Okay, here's the deal. I was the answer key. Mm. I go, so there's no answer key that I know that exists. I go, I, you were comparing to my answers. I go, so we disagree, I guess, on five of the 66 questions. And I said, let's like go through them one by one. Well, he went my way on a couple of them after we talked about it. Um, I went his way on a couple of them. And then there's one or two that were just kind of really ambiguous. And like, he's like, I have no idea what Rich was thinking here. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no, I mean, I don't know what the heck he was thinking here. Only Rich knows, right? So um, I kind of left it at that. I used that as the answer key. And I put it out there attached to our academic project called 40 in 20 out, which, um, which publishes transparent CTA trend every minute of every trading day. And I can tell you a little bit yeah, we'll later about that. The, yeah. Sec. So what was, what were those, some of those five questions that were on either side that had Jerry Parker confused? Oh, shoot. I don't, you on the I, spot. I, I, yeah. I can't remember. Um, I'd have to look back at the notes. Um, sorry. I, I, I don't recall, but, um, they did a subsequent um, on the Top Traders Unplug, Top Traders Unplugged uh, podcast, which yeah. is yeah complimentary to yours. Um, they went through. He Neil sprung it on Jerry one day. He said, "We're going to do something different today," and they went through every question um, live. So that was mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. But you know, a side note: what we're th what we're thinking about, what we've been working on, and I want to tap you on this. Um, we need to modernize that. There's a lot of questions on there. They're just like antiquated. Yeah. All right. Um, well, let's yeah. get, we'll go through it another day. Yeah. The, um, but what go back to that origin story. So the, the idea there was, Hey, we put the ad in the paper. Mm -hmm. People came in, we gave them this quiz based on how they did on the quiz. We said, you get into the program. We think we can teach you how to train. Yeah. The, I mean, that was a Genesis. They were looking for people that thought a, 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 
a certain way um now i think they should have taken someone with a very low score and said can we turn this guy around i mean that would yeah. have been really interesting because you know they already had they already had people that are kind of moving or in the right direction they said like let's take these people and see if we can teach them the trade right and the first there was 13 people in the first tranche of the turtles and then another 10 later and they taught them the rules and they gave them a little bit of seed capital some guys bounced out and couldn't do it but the guys that were able to follow the rules they subsequently funded with millions of dollars in trading and eventually gave rise to what we now know as the cta uh, our managed futures industry that we know and love right yeah and chesapeake jerry parker uh yep. liz cheval emc still mm -hmm. we have allocated to both those um those are great guys so brian's yeah. done it too he was another guy he got 95 96 percent and we you know talked about the one or two or three questions that we kind of disagreed on or you know i told him the whole story these are jerry's answers so he he's right <laughs> down the street from me i'm in highland park and they're they're uh just down the street from me so okay. I, I see brian now and again brian proctor yeah. um so and we'll talk real quick skiing just because i love to talk about that and people complain in the comments that we talk too much skiing not enough quant so give it to me you were just out in whistler yeah we took the kids 7 11. i grew up in vancouver so we used to ski up there all the time when i was there blackcomb wasn't online yet really um and i moved out here to work on the floor at the board of trade in 1991. um so we used to get up at five in the morning you know grab an egg mcmuffin on the way yeah ski all day and then till close and then it was the co-pilot's job to make sure that the driver didn't fall asleep on that treacherous sea to sky road which and, in those days was that pre-olympics so it was yeah oh yeah worse. definitely Did yeah they it, bulk it, was, it all up and yeah yeah it was treacherous they i mean it's great now they've they've like some parts are still a little windy and they couldn't do too much but they really straightened out and made it a lot safer than it used to be um but it, amazing the peak to peak transfer wow that's an engineering marvel um because it used to be in the morning you'd be like you want to ski whistler or blackcomb and you know right down in whistler village you can go up the excalibur lift into blackcomb or you can go up the whistler gondola and like you'd spend your whole day up there now you can go scooting back and forth because it goes right to mid station to mid station it's really phenomenal yeah that's a great it crosses the valley you're saying like a big... yeah oh yeah it's and it's 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 an impressive engineering these guys are clever there's only four towers it's wow it's crazy it's something it was always on my punch list so I'm glad we got to do that on a beautiful day recently yeah have they gotten hammered like the rest of the world country not world yeah and not even really the rest of the Rockies yeah oh with snow yeah um there's a huge base um and we they had like four inches of fresh right before we got up there and right as we left they got like six eight inches which would have been real nice when we were there nice. do you, um do you know about the peak to creek in, i believe so but tell me about it it's an 11 oh. kilometer run yeah it's yeah the largest like contiguous run in north america and it goes from the peak of whistler all the way down to the the creek side gondola um unfortunately there's chunks that were not available to us on this trip so that was too bad i wanted to take the kids down that yeah when we when i stayed there we stayed at that creek side so i think oh, we did yeah. that daily to get back sure yeah uh, back yeah home. the lower creek side yeah mm -hmm. yeah what a great hill though i forgot how much yeah, fun it is it's and beautiful and then even within vancouver proper there were three really good local mountains and you know we could be from house to skiing in like 20 minutes and now from vancouver quickly before we dive into some real stuff what's your take on vancouver real estate and is canadian real estate bubble yeah bonkers. bonkers it's bon it's bonkers um so you know the crazy thing now i know they've gotten away from this it used to be you couldn't get more than a five-year term you could get a 30-year mortgage but the term would reset every five years so I always thought like ultra low rates, you're like, there's going to be some people that are going to wake up to a surprise one day when things reset. So um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how people like can afford in general there. There's like the shacks are 1.8 million Canadian. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's 
they've actually much like our 529 savings plan they've started to talk about introducing a similar plan so that young people can get enough for a down payment which I think is you know bold right however doesn't this kind of put an underlying bid to the yeah, whole yeah. prices uh, you know better than not I suppose but I don't know that that bubble um and just the, refuses the problem is Chinese money still of yeah it, it goes back to 86. everyone was worried about the Hong Kong handover and it was a million dollars for you know a 20 square meter apartment in in Hong Kong or you could buy this stately mansion right by UBC and people quickly did the math and go well that's an easy swap and Canada said bring me your tired your hungry your moneyed masses and through the I, when I was so I was actually a dual citizen I was born in San Diego and I became a Canadian citizen when I moved to Chicago to make five bucks an hour on the floor as a runner in 1991 and I said what if things don't work out I better can I go home so I applied for my Canadian citizenship and got it around then they were doing entire citizenship like swearing in ceremonies in Cantonese and Mandarin like a really? room full yeah. of people it was nuts and so for their citizenship that's great yeah, yeah yeah they you know they didn't yeah they just they just churned them out and like that's you know they call it Hong Coover is is affectionately yeah. you know um yeah there's a lot of that money is over there it's it's impressive and that's the depressing part right of like all these young people how are they ever gonna afford buy a home yeah exactly yeah. and then you've got these some young wealthy Chinese that have a Lamborghini and can't get it out of put the car into reverse you know <laughs> <laughs> you might want to start with a Jetta or something to you know get get you yeah. down with the whole driving thing <laughs> you might want to learn how to drive before jumping into the Lamborghini mm. just um, a thought just a thought so you mentioned being a runner at the board of trade uh I was a clerk board of trade bond pit what pit were you in again so I my first gig was uh assistant controller in Vancouver and I quickly kind of revamped all of their back office things and was doing some really early um early stuff that like led to Gus and Otis and anyway I had pretty good command of the back office and a fella came out to Chicago and he said anytime you want a job you got it is five bucks an hour no benefits yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah I'm like yeah you drive a hard bargain and uh, he, he explained to me but what you get is access and a batch and you get down there and he goes you're going to meet people and then you can he goes you got to bootstrap your way up unless you've got a rich uncle that's where everybody starts so I really took that to heart and I said um yeah I'll let you know when I'm serious and I felt like I had to do it because I saw the Vancouver Stock Exchange go fully electronic and that happened like on my watch I saw the, the old board markers you know I was going to be a board marker and work my way up and I saw it happen on the VSE it went all electronic I'm like well that's going to happen in the futures markets um so I better get my butt over there um so my first and I, so I had been trading for myself also that's kind of noteworthy um, before you went to Chicago yeah um I was actually I backed into trend following in a weird way um so my I show up and they're like we need you in the grain room and it was LIT mm -hmm. uh, we, we used to clear Stotler then everything transferred yeah. to LIT and I thought to myself LIT London Interbank Trust I'm going to go to Chicago for a few years then I'll go to Europe for a few years because I'll clearly work my way up the chain and then I'll come back to the West Coast where your day starts at five in the morning, you know, but you're basically done at one in the afternoon. You've got your whole day ahead of you. Yeah. So that was kind of the loose 20 year plan. And um, I started in the grain pit in the grain room. My first day was the Russian coup. <laughs> and like, yeah, well, and like, so I, you know, I already had a sense for markets and, and trading and I mean it's obviously it's very overwhelming and I was looking around going I got to get this piece of paper to the person in the middle of that pit like this is bonkers there's got to be a better way and um I my pretty much my first day uh, I became a sub deck holder uh in the in the bean pit because 
by the time you beat your way into the middle, I mean, people are sopping with sweat and everything. And you got people with these running these orders and it's a cancel replace that's like out of range. You know, it's a straight yeah. cancel that's out of range in the wrong direction. <laughs> and they're running in like it's a 500 lot market order and shoving it in people's face. I'm like, you have no idea what's happening here, do you? Right, right. No you clue. need to put that in your pocket. That doesn't. Yeah, yeah I mean, no one's going to be up, get upset if you take your time with that one because it's out of range in the wrong direction. So um, I quickly took it under myself to like just grab all the paper, sort it and like give it to our filling broker and in in you need this, you know, like sort, sort, sort. Um, and like, then take the fills coming on the other way out and handing it to the people, uh, to the runners. Like, Hey, take this back to the desk. Give this, give this to Joe. I, you know? I try and to, I try and explain to people the amount of paper that was on the trading phone. I can't, I don't think anyone realizes like literally how much paper there was. My, my favorite is Jay Homan. Yeah, I don't know Jay Homan. D oats okay oh yeah yeah there's four guys standing around in the oats and you could bring a piece of paper to him with a market order right and he'd like bang it out he'd see there and he'd endorse it and you're standing right there and he just drop it <laughs> right in front of your face oh, the... are you serious sir I'm okay yeah. i got it okay yeah the paper was ridiculous wasn't it which and you're like, why? Yeah, of course it went electronic. Like to manage all that and like what you were doing intuitively, but that's now what electronic of like, okay, this order isn't important. Kick it back out. Yeah. This yeah, order. exactly. Some fuzzy logic, right? I mean, yeah. it, I, and the other thing I remember was being in the wheat pit and I got to be good friends with some, yeah, well, Cavi, he's my Cavi. Yeah, so Cavi yeah. was kind of part of this circle and we had a really great, uh, execution team and uh, good filling broker. Um, and I remember being in the pit and, you know, it's like, I can, whatever the handle, it doesn't matter. It was like 523 or whatever. I'm a sell your 20s, sell your nine, sell your eight, sell your 17, sell your sixes, sell your fives. It still says 23 on the board. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking, you know, the fast moniker goes up and then you see a 20 and then you see, these scattered prints. And I just remember thinking to myself, and I kind of knew this intuitively when I was in Vancouver, I was like, I'm so far away from the action that by the time these things are occurring, like that ship has sailed, sir. Like way long time. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, eight cent move in weeds, like huge. And I, I'm just thinking to myself, if I was in my office in Vancouver, I'm picturing these guys sitting around with a cup of coffee and like, going, blah, 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 like getting on the phone and going, you're screwing me Chicago and um, like thinking just the lag time with them getting their information. And I remember watching this and like, we go from 23 down to 15 in like just the blink of an eye, right? Pause. People are getting totals. They start endorsing, checking orders, three, two, one, the phone bank starts lighting up. Right. No. And now all come all these, these panic orders come flying in. And um, anyway, it was just that, that was that was pretty cool to see that stuff happening in real time. And it kind of affirmed what I already kind of knew or suspected. And like back in the office in Vancouver was like, wow, these things are I don't think they're out to screw us like single handedly. It's just yeah. we're very far from where the price discovery is happening. We used to take people who wanted to trade online if they ever came to Chicago and we'd be like, hey, we'll take you on a tour of the floor. And we'd walk over and there was like the dot matrix. Tick, 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 and that's where the online orders were printing. Yeah. <laughs> onto a thing. And then some clerk would rip them off and take them into the pit. And I'm like, and there was a pile. We came down there one day and there's a pile of them stacked like this. Like it hadn't been ripped off the printer. Yeah, I'm like, that's at least 10 minutes old, your market order that's at the bottom of this stack of paper. So yeah, it's, go ahead, uh, <laughs> online trade your life away. Okay, so with one day, we had a bunch of this really good wheat desk. These guys are great, um, really strong execution team. Um, so like a five for your listeners, a 500, you know, 500 bushel order in the wheat is a pretty big order. And um 
500 we had a, contracts yeah or if you know a 500 lot right which yeah. is not contract it'd be 100 contracts now because it was you know the stupid 5,000 oh got it yeah yeah anyway so they so all right so um the we've got the customer says we've got like a lot to do today like five million of this stuff so he's coming in in 500 lot increments and um so he we, to get our broker's attention there'd be a clap greg <laughs> hey greg he'd like poke his head out 500 market okay and he'd go and he'd, he'd bang it out and do whatever well one of the locals was on to us and, and so you, you he kind of after three three times he, he greg comes over he goes boys listen up numb nuts over there is picking us off all right so what i want you to do and this is at your discretion you you know do the regular thing call me over i'll poke my head up you give me the old bunt signal like the <laughs> like this you know yeah i will disregard the next and only the next, the next. one order and that's it and so <laughs> okay okay so we kind of sit around i i'm i'm watching this all go down and I'm, I'm like this is hysterical so great great yeah what up buddy yeah bun signal okay <laughs> toss him over <laughs> so 500 market really slow slow action right okay i'll sell 500 turns around and the other guy's cleaned out everything he goes great quarter bid for 500 because he just cleaned out everything he's sitting there make it easy for you pal quarter quarter 500 oh i got nothing what, <laughs> what do you mean you got nothing yeah. what do you mean you got that i just saw your clerk oh you were watching my clerk hey guys this guy's watching my clerk anyway they they ramp it up on this guy a few cents just on principle to teach him a lesson <laughs> and they're like okay i guess that pretty much covers the picking off and watching my desk okay right cut yeah. that out we'll do baseball signs all day long oh yeah right well yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep this up this is just our our early stuff and and do you feel like that's what scared a lot of people out of futures markets like all that run right, i don't want to i hesitate to call them shenanigans but they were kind of shenanigans and all this floor trading stuff and like you said you're in an office somewhere in la trading whatever in oklahoma trading oil and you're like they're screwing me in the pit but it was they're providing a service they're filling these orders best they can and then it's like there is gamesmanship it's a live pit they're all competing against each other in the moment so I don't know stop. if there's a question in there, but yeah, what's your yeah, thought? stop. No, that's not what drove people away. I mean, of course, the great stories from the pork bellies and everything um, yeah. are, yeah, there's there's been some outrageous things have happened for sure. And yeah, I'm shocked, shocked to find the gambling has been going yeah. on. <laughs> um, but I don't think that's the real reason that they got scared. Uh, and they're still scared. There's still this, this, this ongoing theme in the futures markets that i won't trade that that stuff is scary are you kidding me honestly yeah the only thing they're scared of is like they've got poor risk management and there's a lot of leverage so yeah. they start with 10k i mean 95 percent of the people that start with 10k trading futures are going to at one point lose all their money i mean there's just the the risk of of absolute ruin is super high right because they can't manage their risk Right. Um, so you're trading at 200K nominal level with 10K or something. So, right. Yeah, like that's another example of you like not being, if you, if you, you know, if you have $5 million and you're trading a 20K account, like you could do this all day. Like, you know, you're not ever going to be concerned. So um, they've got problems trading in the futures, but they've got no problem trading equities. And the pro the issue is the equities, they don't have the same sort of leverage happening. Right. Yeah. So, they it's a, but it's okay these meme stocks are going that crazy right yeah or trade some call options on amc and yolo yeah. yeah yeah and 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 what they do is they're still seeking that leverage because they can't take down 5000 shares of xyz so then they start reaching for these you know one week options like you're it's bonkers they're it's crazy how one day now yeah yeah as you, yeah i mean yeah 
it's crazy and it's so if they only knew how bad this is for themselves um because what we have on the equities is the the front running right and if you think it's bad in the outright equities it's double bad in the options yeah and you might have a good trade on good luck getting out you know and it's a hot potato you're not going to get out till they let you out and those the, they're wider and they're generating long gamma so they're buying them and they're melting and they they they're buying them into the worst part of the melt and when the the theta really kicks in so i mean they're just they want leverage you know and they're comfortable with stocks and um it's just if they only knew how bad they're getting ripped off in most cases my thought is always what at some point that should self correct right there's not an unlimited bucket of retail people who want to blow through their savings yoloing these options like at some point you'd think they'd be like oh cool i made some money but generally i've been getting hammered on this and they realize that the spreads are wide and that the market makers are not nefariously but just like hey they're protecting their risk they're doing what they do and they have the edge over that retail investor so i don't know to me it's going to self correct and they're going to be like all this option volume is going to turn over a little bit as they'd be like okay this isn't a quick way to wealth they're just going to ultimately throw it all into view and call it a day. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it, it, talking about equities, um, I got a fun story for you. Talking about like equities and structural edge. Because now all the structural edge, like most people don't even understand, like Ken Griffin's the other side of most of their trades, right? Um, and all the dark pools and the sub pennying um, is legalized front running is what it is right and every time you get a better fill just know you were used um as leverage against someone else right yeah so uh i mean the whole thing kind of makes me vomit in my mouth um, yeah <laughs> but um back in the 2000s uh where do they t- bring payment for order flow to futures <laughs> oh great <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that in a minute sorry go <laughs> ahead with your story yeah so um i for a nanosecond there i was doing you don't remember the so's bandits oh yeah some of my good buddies were neck deep in that telling me to get in sending me statements like we made 600k yesterday yeah it's just who could hit the button fast enough to that's right jump in front of an institutional order right well it was you know picos would be half bid and it'd be offered it even on the on amex and you could if you were fast you couldn't if you you know click click you yeah. know, you'd lift the evens and sell the halves and you'd make a free half point. And it, so it was, it was pure price inversion arbitrage. And some people came out with some software and opportunities would pop up and you would click, click. And if you were fast, which I was, it was, it was kind of a good deal. And then what started happening, the, um, they would start to decay or bust uh, orders and say no that never happened you're like that was four hours ago bro what do you mean it didn't happen (laughs) it most certainly did happen uh no we're busting it oh and the reason code would be like inverted price of market you're like that's not my problem that's like not a thing and um let me talk to the the pit committee i am the pit committee it was when they started busting trades that game was over because you couldn't really rely on everything on on your fills that you were getting but this one fella who had funded a group that I, I was part of, um, he says, you got to talk to the guy that's backing all this. He he needs a programmer. I'm like, all right. I mean, this thing's pretty cool, but like, yeah, I'll talk to him. So I go, I meet with this guy. He's got a small enclosed office um, embedded within first options before they were bought by Goldman. And he smokes, he's the chain smoker. And it's him and this other guy. And he's like, I need some help with something. I'm like, all right, I'm all ears. Well, what he was doing was basically a a Toby Crable-esque opening range breakout type system, where as soon as the opening print would come out, he put in a buy stop above the market, sell stop below the market to initiate a new trade. And once he got in a trade, he'd be be doing some add-ons and he'd use a trailing stop. And he was doing all this by hand. Yeah. Yeah and i'm like oh bro by hand Ooh, that's kind of tough so um it, i mean but it was working and he was making some money and he, was, he wanted to ramp up operations and he was there's this crazy thing though whenever remember with the uptick rule 
a sell short, a good till cancel sell short stop order must be filled on an uptick. Well, they weren't get being filled in a timely fashion or if at all. So he'd be getting short, short, short. And this is all kind of under the radar stuff, like nothing more than 600 shares of the clip. So it's all kind of like penny ante for the most part. Um, but, you know, they would. you got four add-ons, you know, you're looking at 3,000 shares. That's not a bad line. And um, the crazy thing is he, he would get all these, ex these trades were elected, they were due, but he wasn't getting filled. And he'd be trading as if he was filled because he uh, knew they, they'd yeah. come in eventually. And he would either lock in a small loss or lock in a profit or whatever the case may be. But he, let's say he got short 3,000 shares. He'd be covered all. And it shows he's long 3,000, but he knows he's flat. But he doesn't have the fills yet. Well, an hour would go by or something or two. Now he's getting triggered on the upside. He's getting long. So now he's long like 3,500 shares and now he's long 4,000 shares, but he knows he's really only long 1,000. Well, I don't want that stuff now. Selling 3,000 shares three bucks ago. No, thank you. I don't want that. Cancel, right? You are out. Like, you kidding what? me? Yeah. It just gave me $9,000. Like, thanks for shopping at Walmart. So he's like, I don't understand why this is happening, um, but it is happening and we're kind of exploiting it and i called it oh it's like a free call option the, the, with them not filling this order in a timely fashion so we had fella came in from new york and we went out for a drink and i said so what is happening he explains to me those orders were kicking out on little ticket printers in at the specialist post and while the specialist he's got a five thousand dollar armani suit while he's moving blocks <laughs> yeah is like he's got minions below him that are dealing with all this other penny ante stuff because he's got a five thousand dollar Armani suit. And yeah, he's moving he blocks. Don't bother me with the little stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. And it would be like the 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 kid, the the Jamoke kid, or the nephew of the guy he didn't really like that he knew from grade school that was like filling this and um, doing not a particularly good job of it. So um, we said we'll we'll do that for you. Like we'll monitor these trades and and in if they did fill us poorly like on the low of the day we'd be like uh uh uh, uh at 9:42 we're due this price at 10:10 we're due this price and we call them into dot services and we get all the fills per exchange rules because yeah. we were watching every tick and um this thing we went out we didn't have a losing day for years it's almost like the early days of high frequency kind of a little bit of right of like hey knowing the order types knowing how the orders route knowing where you have to get filled um who what can you share the name who was it? oh it was a small group of us it was at emerald trading and um i was huh? promised uh, a piece of the firm we'd start the day flat and end the day flat and i think our biggest one day was up 450k so I, he brought me in and I automated this stuff because that's what I do. And yeah. boy, do, do we really, we ramp things up. Uh, we just ramp them up. As Then some of the specialists were kind of on to us. The 3M guy was notorious. And I kept a table because each specialist at each post, he'd have like a couple marquee names. Then he'd have a bunch of like garbage, like these debentures and just other yeah. tertiary stocks and the one traded. And I kind of kept a table of by post of what their their stocks were. So a guy would, for example, open down three dollars the first print, you know, down to and we went through decimalization, by the way. Down 298, you're filled, you sold three thousand, down two ninety-eight, down one bid, even bid up a dollar bid, right? But boom. Like you're filled, you sold three thousand in the in the hole. Have a nice day. Those we got to fill immediately on, right? I'm like ah, oh, golf clap, congratulations, sir, you figured us out. So then I had a subroutine just especially for those guys. Um, I called the tormentor, and I would just <laughs> I would get tormentor. the the tormentor, and I would just go okay, cancel all orders in this in this stock in this issue. But I also know he's got these tertiary stocks and debentures and everything. So I just ran a tormentor and it would place a bunch of orders, order check, cancel, replace. And every time these activities occurred, guess what? 
same ticket printer. Did it, did it, did it. Did yeah. it, did it, did it, did it. So I the guy I get a call from dot services. A specialist has has asked if you would mind not doing whatever the hell it is you're doing. <laughs> Cause I'm picturing him running out of rolls of paper. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, listen, I, I propose that the specialist does his job. Yeah, and that he becomes that, more special. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. And the, instead of like worrying about like yeah anyway um we would put them in the penalty box for like three months and then we would slowly reintegrate and we'd get the money back we just like hey remember me i want that money back um yeah so basically i think what what the by the wholesaling of orders are doing like they're able to do this sort of thing and people just don't know they're just Right. They, you're saying like, like basically Citadel is doing that on a massive scale these days. Basically. Um, Something ish. You know, by um, sub pennying and st- standing in front, they can for sure lock in a 0.1 loss with a good chance at getting a 0.9 gain. Right. Yeah. And if yeah, I could yeah. do that all day, I would. Yeah. yeah. I would too. And those crocodile tears drive me crazy. You want to take away our single biggest expense? Go ahead. We'll be more profitable. Oh, baloney. So let's shift gears. So speaking of big Chicago prop firms, you worked at DRW for a bit. Um, design it. Well, tell us what you're doing there and what it was like there. So I was, um, I had learned trend following in 93 from a firsthand source. I can't tell you what it is. I can't. And I, I didn't learn the the turtle model. I learned like facets of it, like ATR based stop sizing. Yeah. And, you know, it's significant highs and lows and things like that. So I kind of, I got, it was even better than being taught the turtle program. I had enough to begin my process of discovery. And when I had my aha moment, I went, holy crap, I've been looking at this wrong. I've been worrying about MACD and RSI and all these other things that just really don't matter. And um, I figured out like, oh, this is how you do it. And so I started trading for myself and you know, I had like 10K in my account and then I had to have 60K in my account. And it was like shooting fish in a barrel in the mid nineties. It was a great trading time. So um, what I was at a French company called Finicor Vendôme and we had a fantastic execution desk. It was execution only. We did a little bit of clearing, but it was mostly just execution. And we had the best guys in the world on, on the bond box. And so they would be telling, you know, they'd be calling out, you know, 10, 11, you know, 100 up, 10's trading, at eight, at seven, Baldwin, Nick Foro pressing it, even to trading. Like they, we'd be <laughs> getting that kind of color. And it was the best execution team I have ever worked worked with they were fantastic i used to get calls we'd we'd have the trolley system with the hoot and a holler and i'd have like eight slots for people to listen in and you could talk to them on a microphone i'd have before the payroll report and i always get a few people call me up can i listen in i'm like you can listen in but i'm turning you down if you talk i'm not going to hear you and you know this is privileged information you're hearing right. um so um back when stocks and bonds traded together <laughs> <laughs> so um I cover one of the clients I covered was DRW, one of DRW's basis traders, mm. it, basis trader. And so we had a good rapport and uh, we used to shoot them all day, you know, 50 lots, 100 lots and all that sort of thing. So DRW was a, a customer and um, we this would have pre-electronic or in the early days of electronic. This is pre-electronic. <laughs> Yeah, no, mm-hmm. the, the, that was all a pipe dream at that time. We, I mean, I was excited for it, but yeah. it was pre-electronic for sure. And um, so I was covering a couple of these guys. And, you know, we'd throw, you know, parties and have champagne and stuff. And I got to meet Don. And Don is a very, um, you know, he was very, um, people were in awe of him, right? Yeah. Smart guy. Really smart guy. Engaging. Smart guy. Yeah, and he people were just kind of in awe with him. I mean, he was a customer, so we always got along, and I was nice and polite. And then um, he, we started talking sailing, and I had sailed in Vancouver, and um, I he was looking for some crew, 
So I started crewing on his boat. And of nice. course, he, he could have any boat he wanted, but he chose the Tartan 10 fleet, the T-10 fleet in Chicago, because there's about 85 boats in the fleet out based out of um, Chicago Yacht Club. And they had very strict rules about buying new sheets and or yeah. new sails every year and all that sort of thing. It was a very well-run thing. It really came down to tactics and crew. Um, you know, each race was very competitive. And he, you know, he's not one to shy away from competition, right? So right, that was before being a sailor myself. That was kind of before the one design movement, right? And right. 35s and all that, where people like, oh, okay, it's all the same boat and it's just coming down to your skill. Versus my father, actually, in my sailing career, was on the other side of that, where he was like, no, we're going to buy our way to victory. We've got the best sales. We've got the North sales reps on giving a strategy. Like, he was a good sailor. The Kevlar. Was, yeah, that was the flip side of that was, hey, hey, you can spend as much money as you want to make your boat as fast as possible. And you're racing next to the guy who has a year old sales. Yeah, and they or, had a or, bit of a handicapping system, but it wasn't. Yeah, perfect. right. The, and that the mixed class where, like, you see these two boats and like one clearly beats the other, but he, he loses because of the time. Handicap. Yeah. You got to give him a minute per mile or whatever. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, the, we like the head to head competition was great. Yeah. You know, that's what was nice about the, the one design. And um, so I was crewing for him and um, I told, I was telling him about all this money I was making trading, doing trend following. And um, he basically said, well, shit, why don't you come do that for me? I'm like, indeed, why don't I? Yeah. So he, great. yeah, so he, this would have been, I, I was in Paris for a year. He was in London, um, came back. I was covering some of his guy. We kept in touch, all this sort of thing. It's kind of a long story that's boring. But um, he said, why don't you come do that for me? He grub staked me um, 300 grand account size to start. Uh, this would have been 97 into 98. And um, my first year trading, I made a million bucks. And I remember being up, I remember being up a couple hundred thousand. And this is like, do you remember 98? There's too much stuff. It was a deflationary spiral. There was yeah. unsold box cars of apples would stretch mm. from Washington state to Chicago. We overbuilt all this stuff. It was a big theme at the time was too much stuff mm. and a deflationary spiral. So. Um, yeah, I I I remember being up a couple of grand. And he's like, "That's a lot of money for you. You gonna take it?" You know, there's a split, right? And I'm like, "No, I, I don't think we're done yet. I think this the positions I have on are gonna be worth a million bucks." And then there was like a test, and they tried to shake you out of everything, right? Then all of a sudden, I was up only fifty grand, and he's like, "You sad? Okay. You didn't take that take that money?" I'm like, "Don, here's the thing. I still have these trades on." I'm still in. They didn't get me out of much of anything. I go, I'm now more convinced than ever. This is going to be worth a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so then, you know, the 98, the Asian crisis happened and everything went like, like we were warning about. And so that was, that was a pretty good year for me. Um, and yeah, that was a good year. It was a good time. It was a great weren't yeah. you rules based anyway so did it matter you weren't going to yeah. get out the, the we're trend not said to get out. we're not computerized yet right uh, okay so um the deal is this like and i i mean i would sit there and like i you know used aspen graphics which was like a cqg offshoot remember it yeah and i you know i had an excel and i had spreadsheets and i would incorporate into a database and i create all these trades and um so I, I was on my way to automation, but I still had to call New York to place these orders, right? And once you get a human on the line as like placing orders, um, yeah, we weren't, I couldn't type into a computer yet. Um, Globex was just barely coming online at the time. Project A wasn't quite yet out there. So once you're calling or like, I'll just watch it or I'll put an alert, right? Um, I'll give it a little couple ticks room. Now you're introducing something else in there. Yeah, yeah. like, oh, I wouldn't do that right now. You have the big whatever. Big reports coming out in, yeah, in they, three minutes. Would you would you an idiot? You're gonna put that order right, in. Goldman now? just added twenty thousand with their role and blah blah blah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a million shit. Really? (laughs) It's what you what you uh, what you finally understand. And hopefully sooner rather than later, it's always you against yourself. Right. And that is the chief. The chief theme of all trading is you versus yourself. Markets are going to do whatever the hell they're going to do with or without your participation. And so your five lot, 15 lot, 60 lot, one lot ain't going to change much of anything at all. Um, so really you realize it's just you against yourself. And so the closer, you know, I was able to match what I had on my paper, that was always kind of the goal match what I have on my paper. Now here's the other rub is, um, my, I, I would calculate my margin equity ratio and I mean, 40%, Hmm. 45%, like these are not levels I could even get to now being like fully automated. I couldn't even get anywhere close there there's too many risk overrides and protection in place and my stuff's automated right now and it would never get there so right and just listeners the average across the trend following industries 10 percent, 12 and a half percent something like that yeah i'm closer to six percent and never over 15 now but um at that time it was it was rock and roll baby yeah but do you think that model's dead um just of like hey here's a chicago prop firm that's going to give you money to trade because you have you've been making money or is uh, it way yeah. more now just all computerized what edge can we find and mine until it's dead and then find the new edge i don't know the the guys like you know the euro dollar market makers um you know they were looking to make like four bucks a trade you know that's down to like 12 cents in a pick and market yeah so like good luck there um and i've i've been approached or talked to several prop shops and i'm like look I, i'd like to ramp things up why don't you i'll give you guys a very good split you know 25 million let's go and yeah. a lot of them that i'm talking to now they're like um yeah well we can ramp things up but we want you to be the first million in loss yeah like mm-hmm. i don't need you for that i get right. 100 percent like, I don't need you. I mean, I'm offering you the opportunity to get some diversification and make some money. It's got positive EV. Like, you want it or not? And like, they, um, so they, I don't know. So I, the prop model. Um, and then like DRW, I mean, they're, I'm, they're doing fine, I'm sure, with their market making activities and they don't have any outside money to deal with. Right. Um, and they went heavy into crypto and <laughs> market making and crypto and mining the crypto. Yeah, from what I understand. Yeah, a lot um, of them have. I've not, another funny story about Don. Like, he used to be the king of the euro dollar options, right? And or he'd be in like the euros trading strips packs bundles, or he'd be in the euro dollar options. And I remember one day he he called me up and he's like, "Um, we got any sugar on? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, what are you talking about? You should be talking like volatility cones and." you know and yeah. smile and like what are you going on about sugar because like, all the guys in here are talking about sugar i'm like oh geez are you kidding me we've been long for 85 days now like and now they're talking about sugar uh yeah. we oh, we must this chart. we must be reaching a terminus here i need to take some off on principle just because these jamokes are talking about it um <laughs> <laughs> but but when you're like when you're in one a lot of these uh prop shops you know you're in one sector like i would go nuts i mean i don't like right like sitting there for five years just doing one thing right and and hoping it does something at some point you know and they're banging out ticks and they can't you know the forest through the trees they're banging out ticks meanwhile the thing's consolidated in a three-year range and when it pops out they're ill prepared for like hilarity ensues yeah like the and then We'll get into our, we still haven't got into our real stuff, but this has been fun so far. But um, what are your thoughts on you starting out? Like, hey, just make your name for yourself in the pit and like climb up the ladder. Like that's gone. So what happens to that next layer of people such as yourself, such as me? Like, where do those people come from if they don't don't start on the floor, right? That seems to be a problem. I don't know. And like, you know, this whole work from home business, I mean, it's great for us because we've got, Kid, I don't know. You you got yeah. kids? They're yeah, a little yeah. older now. Like mine are seven eleven. I mean, it, it, it's great for us. Um, 
but we earned it getting on that damn l train at 5 30 in the morning <laughs> exactly freezing i mean fully like ding 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 market opens at seven you're here you're not here right and um a lot of guys didn't make it hey that's where's... a great point you can't be like oh, i'm sick today like no no that, that thing's dinging whether you're sick or not that's right and i mean i occasionally stuff happens right but you know repetitive you know like is this the straw that breaks the camel back you know you can party with the boys but you got to get up with the men you know like you didn't have to be out till two or if you were and you still showed up like good on you you're 23 and you should be doing silly stuff like that right um but you know i don't know how these guys earn their stripes now and we've talked in the past on this pod i can't remember who with but that was a big difference between chicago and new york right new york mm -hmm. it felt like in my mind had to go to the right school know the right people have that to get into a goldman get into jp morgan chicago hey you could bust your way in through that door without even going to high school and if you could think on your feet and yell and push people around you could make a living so right it seems like yeah. now it's chicago's kind of lost that part of it and now you have to have the same stuff as new york oh and it's by the of... way you know an impressive pedigree doesn't mean you can trade oh yeah yeah no you know way. smart people do dumb things all the time i use an example all the time a, a slide um you know 28 out of 28 primary dealers are looking for this to happen in interest rates and you know what actually happened not that right yeah so that was on our two weeks ago pod of that we actually pulled that up on the screen those that squiggly line chart where all the right the rates go like this on the video listeners i'm pointing up to the right and the squiggly lines are always way off way off. yeah and those are the estimates so the yeah the worst uh, the worst of projections are the federal reserve right yeah Right. And we've all seen like I hire a quant, you get them in there, they build this model and it is terrible and they have no idea because they don't have the street smarts to be like, oh, it should work. I don't understand what the problem is. I remember we when I was there at DRW um, this in 97, 99, there was a we had a PhD on staff and he was actually a terrific help. Um, he really did help with a lot of things in my some of my early um, research and efforts. Um, but he was all hell bent on doing this high frequency stuff. I'm like, Lester, I mean, listen, I was just the I was just sitting at the the Globex machine and I it doesn't matter what the handle was, you know, four thousand and three. The four oh threes are trading. It said offered at ninety five on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I was selling some oh threes. I'm like, twelves are trading. I sold some twelves and it the 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 matching server and the quote server weren't really talking to each other at that time yeah, yeah. and i'm like guys 13s are trading they're like no it's offered in 98 i'm like try to buy them then i gotta go yeah try to buy them go for it go yeah. for it yeah go for it i'm telling you 13s are trading i'm telling they're you they're trying to build a model on the quote server basically well yeah. and, he, and well it was like he's doing this sub second stuff i'm like eh, bro like the, the thing is so broken right now um you know I, I wish there was an API at the time, but like you're getting a little ahead of yourself, bro. It's like yeah. I, I maybe we'll be there one day. Well, you know, here we are 20 years later and they're there. So um, you know, way to go, Lester. <laughs> but at the time I thought it was like Don Quixote chasing a windmill. I'm like, good luck with that. <laughs> So let's shift gears, talk a little bit about your models, about 4020. Um, where, where do you want to start? Uh, well, okay, Roots of the Academic Project. How about that? Sure. Um, it was actually an idea we had back in 2006 um, was to like publish a transparent trend for CTA returns. What we do know um, about see the industry as a whole is a lot of the managers got away from their trend following roots i mean that should be clear um they went multi-strat that should be clear they started to um target vol you know that should be clear and you know they didn't look a heck of a lot like a a, a classic trend follower at some point and yet you know it seemed like their goal was to like raise assets 
and which they did like you know look at winston had what 32 billion aum yep. and you know i'm sitting there i'm like you could be a trend follower if you tried my joke was i was with winton right in their marketing materials it was like we have 86 phds and my joke was always 80 of them are in asset raising <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right but like yeah. i mean you literally you couldn't because like you know the power of trend is in its diversification right i need a diverse portfolio i don't know year on year which of these three instruments is going to make an ass of themselves but often they do occasionally a lot of them bump along in rhyme or a concert um and that's when you make the bulk of your money in very short periods of high cross market correlation but you know year on year you can expect like one or two things like man i really wish on january 1st it was going to be here on december 31st hmm, if only um so that's why you got to kind of take every trade and you know and take the small losses you know they're all exploratory bets as you try to uncover those outliers is i guess a really good way of saying that but these guys aren't doing that really um they focused on financials because that could take the size they barely traded you know they barely took their foot off first base which is an approach um but i don't know why people are paying one and 20 or two and 20 for you to not really take your foot off first base um so um what I my argument was pretty simple. If you were going to do an efficient frontier or Markowitz bullet and use data going back the last 30, 40 years, you're fooling yourself because the CTA indices are dominated by firms that don't really do that stuff anymore. So you should clearly delineate between like the new asset gatherers and multi strats versus the old school CTAs. And what we need is a reliable index to for the returns and most of these indices are dominated by these firms that have you know morphed over the years for whatever reason and there's no right or wrong there but they've morphed yeah but you right. should now, be aware of that the argument on the other side is like hey no this is what the investors want this is what the institutional investors want they want lower vol they want lower activity that's fine then don't use yeah. a 40-year efficient frontier right you know yeah right don't use that. the yeah. yeah that's fine that's good that's great just don't you dare blend that in right and this is the confusion for investors that get upset of like oh i bought this managed futures program but i was sold on trend following on crisis period performance on all that and now i'm getting something else correct so it's it, very important to look under the hood not all all trend followers are managed futures not all managed futures are trend followers correct and that's fine and everyone should find and plot their own path in life and you know let the market determine what they want yeah. you know you'll find out right so um it still doesn't change the issue at hand is like i do want to do a 40-year efficient frontier using trend how am i going to do it like yeah. that's the that's the problem how am i going to do it so what i had proposed and one of my investors he gave a nice endowment gift to his alma mater university of idaho and what they do there, they have um, 400 and 500 level courses um, where they actually trade. Because as you know, you can't tell till you bet. So instead of just like pontificating, they actually have funded accounts where the kids trade. And now they give them a very short leash. But um, I, you could probably remember, it's been so long for me when you pit it out, you get the, the instant sweat because you realize you just lost a whole month's rent in 10 <laughs> seconds. You went, oh, and you know, F9 recalc. No, that's not going to help. That doesn't change anything, right? So hopefully, you know, you go through that at some point in your life. You learn what not to do is probably more important than anything else. So if they could help these kids kind of get some actual real live trading experience, they would be, um, you know, more marketable and have yeah. like a lot more skills. So I was asked to speak at with these with these guys and um there's like 30 kids in the class and i'm talking to the dean of the business school i'm like here's what i think you guys should do there's a need for an index of just pure trend returns just a real baseline model nothing nothing too fancy you know single entry single exit um explainable defensible very 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 vanilla yeah and i go i think you guys should produce it i think you should publish it every day um 
I think it could become like a um something like University of Michigan, something that's yeah. subscription based. And you know, University of Michigan didn't happen overnight. They've been publishing since like the late 40s, right? But now lots of firms are paying for advanced details and you know, in um advanced information and, and advanced details and all that sort of thing. So I go, you guys could be the guys, the the standard bearer. I go, because as a CTA, I mean, I could publish something, but who's going to listen to another yeah. a peer or a colleague, right? It's got to no come from to the vandals, right? Are they the vandals? Yeah, that's but right. right. If you dangle out University of Michigan to University of Idaho, they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be nice to be somewhere in that orb. orb. Yeah, yeah. So I said, and they even had a stipend of, you know, three or four thousand dollars a month to pay the kids to run this right i don't know oh, right. what the problem was well the problem was like who's gonna run it during christmas break yeah. or summer break like well come on you figure it out bro like come on right. you guys can you can figure it out you it, pay right, or go it's a over paid the position. computer science department and automate it some more and yeah. or do something right anyway i thought it would it was a good idea and they dragged their feet dragged their feet and i finally i just said look Honestly, I'm doing this stuff internally anyway, and I, I'm sure many of the managers you speak managers you speak to are running like parallel um, tracking ideas in real time and yeah. seeing. I'm sure. I hope so. I sure hope so. But um, I'm like, I'm kind of doing this anyway. It'd be no big deal for me to like put it out there. And so I, I mocked it up in like a weekend. I said something like this. So. I was really hoping they would pick it up and they they never did. So, but I just started publishing it. We formed a, a separate LLC and called it the Transparent Index Group. And we started publishing this thing every minute of every trading day since 2014, monitoring the trades from cradle to grave. And um, if you think back, the original Turtle program is a 20 day breakout and a 55 day breakout to systems. We picked a 40 day breakout, just one. So it's you know, not too close, not too far, um, risking 25 basis points of AUM on any trade, which is pretty close to standard yeah. and trading a portfolio of 29 different instruments from eight different market sectors and said, we're going to monitor, monitor, these, monitor these things from cradle to, cradle to grave and see the results. That's it. So that gives um, particular- what's the 20 out? So that's 40 in, but 20 on the way out? Okay, so- um, the, the first thing you need to have an initial protective stop right and where we use one 20-day atr okay as the initial stop some people will say that's way too close they might risk like three to five atrs some others might risk 0.25 of an atr or half an atr yep. we're not here to discuss like what the best answer is as if there is a golden perfect answer because and none exists but it's a good place to start. So the initial stop would be like one ATR away from entry. Then as the trade, uh, the, the losses take care of themselves, right? They yeah. get stopped out, lose 25 basis points, have a nice day, move on to the next trade. So the question is about handling the winners. In the case of a winning trade, in like for a long, we would use the, tr the highest of the initial protective stop because that's your no-go line. Um, but as the trade advances, the lowest low of the last 20 days mm, okay. would become the trailing stop. So 40 days to get in the trade, 20 days to get out, 40 and 20 out. And, 40 and 20 out. Yeah. And let's and so, dive into the ATR things just for people who don't understand. So, mm -hmm. and when we ran our trend models, use the same thing. So, right. If you say, I want to risk 25 bips of my equity per trade okay what does that mean right so if i'm trading cotton do i say the thing's worth a hundred thousand dollars worth of cotton and i'm risking 2500 divide that by the contract size you could do it that way so explain the atr method basically you're using that as a proxy for the risk okay so um let's talk about the 25 bips of risk first yeah. so we're resetting we're, we're calling us a five million dollar notionally sized account and you're risking 25 bips of that, and that resets monthly. So it's always 5 million. That's $12,500. Right. 
That's how much you're going to risk. That's your max dollar risk is 12 and a half K on a, on a $5 million account size or spoken another way. If you have a hundred dollar bill, you're going to lose 25 cents. Right. Big whoop. I mean, I would be upset about breaking the hundred because <laughs> <laughs> it's nice yeah. to have a crisp hundo in it your pocket nice at all your, times. Right. But you know, letting go of that crisp hundo is is a little painful, right? And unless you really need it, like a tow truck or something. But so, this is where people get confused. Like, okay, cool. I put on one contract and get out when it loses twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Well, it's not one no, contract, no, no. right? Right. Yeah. 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 It, it could it could be zero contracts um, in some cases. Exactly. So your your max dollar risk would be twelve thousand five hundred. Now, um, okay, boom. Max notional dollar risk, 25 basis points, 12,500. Next. Um, That's outside of the trade setup. That's basically yeah. just like, hey, on each trade, I want to risk this much equity of yep. my equity, put it at risk. Correct. That's it. That's my pure dollar at risk. Yeah. Next, um, we now we need to determine how many contracts. And like, you know, it drives me crazy when I see someone has a, a back test model. It's one lot, one lot, yeah, one lot, yeah. one lot. Like, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I actually now know everything I need to know about you. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I've done it. Everyone's done it and it's a real simple way of doing it, but that's not real, very real world of you, is it? So let's take that $12,500, uh, of notional risk. Let's figure out how many contracts you're going to trade. So ATR or average true range, uh, I, I cause poor man standard D. So if you take the the range from high to low of e the of each trading day and you stack them side by each and take an average of that basically the the average true true range true range takes into account the possibility of Overnight gap moves news. yeah yeah so you know just ignore that for the moment it's a, it's basically an atr is what we can expect on any day from high to low, the range of the thing. Basically what we can expect the thing to move. Now, occasionally there's a catalyst or something. And we can also, by the way, call that N. Yeah. N is what the turtles called the, the ATR. Mm -hmm. So one N is what we would expect the thing to trade on any normal day. And, and of just course, let's talk crude oil most people know right so it last 40 days it's trading between 60 and 75 dollars yep and on average each day it moves a buck 50 from say, the high to high to the low let's say yeah, yeah. let's say a buck to keep the math easy yes <laughs> yeah right it moves a buck times a yep. hundred dollars so that value of its range is a thousand dollars correct correct um, so so what we would do is let's put it this way if you can't take one days of heat what are you even doing doing right. trading this thing <laughs> right, right like honestly if you, you can't take one day heat forget it you 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 belong elsewhere you should put all your money in vu right so, much less where that's where other guys are like if you can't take five times one day heat correct yeah. some people risk five n right so like this is where you you know you start thinking about this and like yeah, it, it this is this is where we, we get real with minutia, right? Yeah. So in this example where crude has a an, an N or a 20 day ATR of one dollar, you say when I get in, I'm gonna risk one dollar away. I'm gonna put my stop, right? Um twelve thousand five hundred divided by one thousand, which is the the notional dollar risk of one N. Yeah. We'll give you 12 and a half contracts since you can't trade. <laughs> I, well, since go you ahead can't trade yeah. half contracts, <laughs> yeah. C micro. Um, just to stick with the bigs for now. Yeah. So you, you would trade 12 contracts. Yeah. And or if it's 12.6, 12. 12. trade 13. That's a whole nother discussion. But yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Now you're technically risking more than 12,000. Exactly. So do you round uh, it up? Uh, or round also, it? <laughs> there should be the important disclaimer. A stop order doesn't necessarily mean you're right. It could be gap down, be limit down four days in a row, and you're right. so. But this is important for people to understand about trend. That's not necessarily a way to control risk, even though it does control risk. To me, the bigger power of it is that's what you do on crude oil. That's what you do on corn. That's mm -hmm. what you do on cotton. That's what you do on Japanese yen. So 
you've now normalized your risk yep. across all those markets. Exactly and if one, correct. right, if you're natural gas a little tamer these days, but back in the day, or palladium was always one, right? Like you, you it'd yep. be hard to get one contract even with $5 million. JGB. On, right, on palladium, some of these contract sizes are very big and the true range is very big and you can't even get to one contract. You know, it's, but, it's sometimes easy to speak in extremes, right? Like if, if you have 50 nat gas on and one corn, does it really matter what the grain market did today? Yeah, no. Yeah. Right. You're just a nat gas trader at that point. You're not a diversified trend follower. That's right. You're, you're turning apples and oranges and all into a common banana, right? Like, yeah. You, and it's, you, it's more than just the risk side, right? So now that I've normalized the risk, I'm putting the same bet essentially. Mm -hmm. I've volatility, I've average true range adjusted all of these bets to be the same. Now, if there's a, we can talk outlier move, there's a six sigma move in corn. I make the same money if there's a six sigma move in yen, right? That's an another side to it that people don't quite understand of like, it's to capture the same outlier profits when the outlier moves happen in the different markets. You got to make sure every bet is the same bet. And then, you know, there's another dirty little secret um, as a pro tip. Um, if it's exciting, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> this stuff really is that a life it, tip is that yeah, yeah no, I don't know that. <laughs> not in the bedroom that doesn't work yeah. in the bedroom. <laughs> so the, it's um yeah it, it's boring i mean done yeah. correctly this stuff is super super boring and i mean I, what does it say about me that i have uh this high passion for something that's so boring super right? boring Right, but I mean, to, to never that point, don't. you're not waking up in the middle of the night like, oh, shit, we have so much yen exposure on. No. Like, no, yeah, it's boring. No, it, it's just doing, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And I, I've, and I will, as I was explaining before, um, when I was, you know, prop trading in, you know, early times, um, there would be times I would sleep with the computer on, right? In the bedroom, yeah. like, because <laughs> I probably had too much on, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't yeah, that's, sleep. Probably got too much. On. Yeah. And this is why why trend followers don't make good podcasts. Usually, because they're talking, they can't talk. They don't care. Like, what do you think yeah. about the yen? What do you? I don't know. I don't care. Yeah, like, man. it's all the same bet, right? Yeah. That's what people don't understand. Why does this guy have no opinion on any of these markets? I don't predict. It's all yeah. very boring. It doesn't make for good copy. I I'm the first to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um. All right, so that's out there, 4020. So what's people can go check it out, 4020. What is the Yeah, web? 40, the number 40 in the number 20 out.com. And we apply this simple, stupid model. I I don't trade the 40 day breakout system. Okay. I'll just share that tidbit. Yeah. I mean, it's it's perfectly reasonable. It's a good place for people to like cut their teeth and begin their research. But if you have a command of that you've probably retrained your mindset already because um, there's a few things people do that are wrong. They always, they always want to be right. Okay. That's probably the number one thing. They always want to be correct. Um, trend following you're right. Maybe 34% of the time yeah. is a pretty good number. And that's okay because you're a hall of famer baseball. That's hitter. right. Yeah. 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 You, you know, it, Lose one, 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 make five, make 15, make 30. Yeah. And keep doing that. And um, the numbers quickly add up. So, um, which is another way of saying positive skew for all you Matthews out there. Yeah. Correct. And then, um, so that's one thing they, they always want to be right. And, you know, this helps like after many observations um, and you see how these things work, probably they get bored and they move on is my guess is and we see that we have about 800 subscribers right now following the academic project and you know every day some people new people are coming in some people are go exiting um but hopefully they pick something up in the process and like by the way the reason we're doing this is a, a better informed investor is a better investor and yeah. if we can help open people's eyes to how trend finally works you know, that's probably a win for everybody. But that's one thing they do. Um, the other thing they do is they ignore the short side. And, you know, you think about water and the, the phases of water, you know, it can be uh, liquid, it can be a solid, or it can be a gas. 
we think about taking a position in the market, it doesn't matter what market, you can be long, flat, or short. So trend following helps you to determine if I'm long, flat, or short. And I, you know, that part's pretty easy. What's more interesting is the part we were talking about with the uh, risk management and position sizing. And that part is a little more nuanced. Um, but people tend to ignore the short side is another common uh, mistake that people have. Um, now, I'll say this. In some cases, um, I remember I was getting a short signal in ARC. And I use this as my prime broker for my own stuff. Um, I have some accounts at Interactive Brokers. And I tried to get short ARC at what I would call the right time. Yeah. H hard to borrow, impossible. Couldn't get any. Yeah. I'm like, you got to be kidding, kidding me. me. Yeah. And I'm talking certainly less than a thousand shares. Okay. Yeah. Give me a break. So um, about a week later, good news. We got some. You want it? Yeah. And I'm like, not now. And I'm yeah. like, but I'm interested. 20% juice. Get oh. out of here. Yeah. You know, get out. I eventually did put some on, but, um, you know, we the there's this theme of ergodicity where yep. th things can be any state at any time and some markets over the years i've determined you just must treat differently than the futures markets that we know and love because we can freely get short it's just as easy to get short as to get long not true in equities or cryptos in equities yep. you need to locate a borrow there could be a punitive loan attached to it so there's, you know, I, I treat equities and cryptos a little bit differently for those reasons. Because well, and that's not... probably why, right? The biggest and the best trend followers in the world don't do single name equities or crypto. Cash yeah. Crypto. yeah. Yeah. And the problem, you know, you can't get freely short the cryptos either. Um, I guess you could do CME's version. Um, yeah. But it, most of these, I, I trade the cash only in cryptos. Um, a lot of these big moves are happening on the weekends, you know, at yeah. two in the morning and the CME is not open. So I, I don't like that, but, um, so I don't know where I was going with all that. Um, I don't remember it. they, <laughs> so the 40, 20, 40 in 20 out. So it's just out there like to me. So you have sock gens trend indicator similar, but it's on a daily basis that that's a 20, 120 day moving average crossover system yeah. that, that their trend indicator. Yeah. That's out there daily. Yeah. Um, and then there's another from, I'm forgetting the name is doing like 50 different trend models, um, and kind of doing, okay, here's the average across all these. I'll send you that name. When I oh, is that Max Kaiser? In, uh, yeah, maybe in yeah. Monaco No, or, or Alex Kaiser, or I can't remember right now, but Trainer, I've, we've, I've had talks with a beer company in Europe worried about aluminum hedging and they always get screwed because these trend followers are on it and they're like can you tell us what those guys are doing i'm like well oh. yes but no like it, you can just run this simple model um, yeah oh my god i want to talk to them yeah i'll set up but there's real world applications for this stuff right of course and yeah. you know the, the, here's the thing like they should they should when it comes to hedging they need to know their hedge ratio and what they're comfortable with yeah of course, you know, their, it, their point is more, and a lot of these are like it, every time we go to hedge, the floor gets pulled out, or like weird stuff happens in the market because of these hedge funds. They call them. oh, like, yeah, garbage. It's a, yeah, it's a little that's weird. That's just guy. It's again, it's you against yourself. Yeah. It, do, this, do some of your orders get you know, bastardized and mistreated? Yeah. But, you know, that's just a cost of doing business, in my opinion. You should build that into your model. Yeah. What's more there's important? There's a good point there. If you could identify, like, hey, these guys are all going to get stopped out at, or right, like eighty percent of them may get stopped out on a new twenty-day low. Mm -hmm. Should we go hedge by, like, two ticks above the twenty-day low? Maybe not. Right. So there's there's some things there of like, sure. Kind of don't place your orders right before a huge trend following industry driven stuff happens i would agree with that yeah although uh, i think that's overdone a lot of the stuff what's the guy uh mcgillicott or something like uh 
right? He's always out there in Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal, like CTAs have driven the market this way and that way. So I it's think such, some of that flow stuff is overdone. That's just, it's horseshit, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's worry about your own stuff. How about that? All right. So speaking of your own stuff, so you said you don't use that. What give us what the totem, what's different with how you're working at it? I mean, I, I would urge people to look at a longer look back window. And um, so it's kind of a trade off, right? Uh, the longer look back window, the higher the quality of signal and the less frequent of signal. And I'm a big fan of not over trading. Um, but you also run the risk of leaving a lot on the table. So you've got to kind of try to spark a, a balance between boldness and humility. And I would, I think 40 days is a little too close. Uh, it's certainly not something like a 20 day. And you've got to always understand there's going to be a lead lag relationship. So when 40 and 20 out is beating me, yeah, I'm a little pissed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's just, you know, that's just life. I know why it's beating me. And then when I'm beating it, I'm like, yeah, take that. Right. But, um, uh, I think, you know, there's no right and wrong answer. And I think if you, uh, you can find greater diversification by overlaying multiple strategies. That's one of the things I've done. Um, the other thing I've done over the 13 years, and what do you mean? Uh, different strategies, different time frames. Um, so yeah, I've got like a couple of, I've got two systems working in concert with each other. And, um, one is a little bit of a quicker reacting. The other one's a little bit slower. I just find like blending them together helps smooth things out for me a little bit. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, it's, it makes for an easier ride for me. Um, then the, the other thing I've call it what it is. Okay. Like 2008 was awesome for trend following what people i think forget about it is like we're not supposed to talk numbers on the on the pod right but the first quarter was really good if if you stopped trading in april it was a good year and we were generally long all commodities short dollar long commodities long stocks it was a great trade in the first part of 08 then things went you know quiet they went sideways and then they reversed and um that was even better and it would it made for a fantastic 2008 so people you know we recollect 2008 we think about the crisis but we forget about the first part of the yeah. of the trade and when i was crewing for don you'll 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 remember this the roll tack yeah yeah you know you get all the crew weight on one side of the boat and then when you tack over it's it's movable ballast and the idea is to keep the boat speed up because yeah. if everyone just sat like a bump on the log, you'd come over, you like, you'd bob there for a minute till the sails filled up and then you'd slowly start to regain your momentum. If you can use this movable ballast concept or roll tack, then you get inertia working with you to keep the boat speed up. And that's the theory. So um, I'll even go back to uh, 97 on that. Then the tie bot blew up it got stronger immediately before it got decoupled. Mm. So, um, and I, I'll never forget that because like as a stupid trend follower, I would have been long the bot. Right. And then I, I would have had a good trade there for about a week. Yeah. And then I would have got stopped out of the bot. And then That's... I would have gone, shit, I'm your Huckleberry. I'll go the other way on the bot. Right. And, and then... that turned into the good trade. The and 22 is a lot like that, in my opinion, right? Like you had mm -hmm. commodities drove the first part of the year mm -hmm. and then short bonds drove the second part of the year. And but the transition was super smooth. Like yeah. a lot of these other years, you're going to have the gains, a quarter where there's big losses as it transitions, and then maybe another quarter or two of gains. 22 seemed to be like this nice, smooth transition of like commodities, like, hey, we're out of steam. Here you go, bonds. You, you run with yeah, it now. That's without right. that big, sharp drawdown, which was nice. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And so m like trend following makes most of its money in short periods of high cross market correlation. And we can actually measure this. Um, there's 
uh, we were publishing this thing on our site and called the Totem Trend Index. And basically, that's my attempt to uh, quantify, standardize, quantify the strength of market trend. And I don't care which manager you throw at me. If I take a look at the monthly average of that, um, I can usually, usually, my opinion, based on observation of running this on multiple managers, um, I can usually tell you which months or show you the correlation. Uh, between a high tr- trend index and the months they're making money. And, and so the question would be, why not filter for that trend index and only put on risk when the trend index is a- at a certain level? And that's a great idea. And it's a notion that I've kind of implemented. And that's one of my differentiators. The rub is on Jan- on April. It flips too fast. Well, we don't know, you know, on April, uh, what are we, April 6th today? We don't know yeah. at the end of the month what the thing's going to be, the average for the month. We don't know oh, that at it. this moment in time. But so, you do it, run it daily in theory, right? Oh, yeah. No, I, I run it every 10 seconds. So yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I can tell you um, exactly where it is. Um, and then, you know, so it's actually, it's not a bad way to be um, like, we made we had a high trend index value the first quarter of last year, and it's been very quiet ever since. So, like people ask me, "What do you think?" I go, "I don't know. I'm very not very motivated right now for the outlook for trend at this moment in time." And now it's obviously subject to change, and I am excited for the fourth quarter of of general election years. So, um, I mean, I think you got to dog paddle for a while until things become more clear. But we also know that. Uh, 13 years of money printing is not good for trend. It wasn't then. And was on March 13th? We've got a brand new four-letter acronym to worry about. Yeah, By, which I've ignored it. I don't, what is it? Yeah. Um, BTFP. Yeah. <laughs> um, which colloquially known as by the F and Ponzi. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is how I'm remembering it. But you know, it, it shows right up in the central bank assets. Um, again, yeah, you you first showed me that chart long ago. Like, track uh, what was yeah. it? Yeah, the the growth of the central bank's balance, balance sheet, sheet plotted inversely against uh, drawdown in CTA, and also the up move in the stock market. And it was uh, Dimitri Alexi, Alexi from Alphabot. Yeah. He, he he gave a speech uh, one time and we were out for lunch. He showed me that. I'm like, Dimitri, you've got to amend this showing, including the ECB, because that explains yeah. the next tranche of pain like yeah. perfectly. And it is perfect. And it's it makes perfect sense. Right. They were on to spur people into risk taking activities and they want to keep a lid on markets being what we would call fun. I.e. And would you and to me that it came out as like we put a lid on volatility that's a little too simplistic probably it it made fewer bets right it made everything one big bet instead of a bunch of different separate bets right which we saw in 22 we saw in 08 like which is weird to say because you say when cross correlations rise trend as well but it's also does well when there's a bunch of separate bets paying off at the same time when Mm -hmm. oil is doing its own thing because russia is acting up when Cotton's doing its own thing because there's a drought in the Southeast when, right, like cocoa's doing something because there's a war in in wherever that is, Ivory Coast. So it's like you need all those different things to hit. And for whatever reason, when the central banks are acting in unison, which is probably mainly because it made the currencies one big trade, right, that put a lid on trend, not on their performance necessarily, but on their ability to access different bets. Yeah. I think that's a fair way of looking at it. And so here we are again with them actively in there. And, you know, those swap lines bailing out Credit Suisse, you know, Swiss National. I always keep a chart of SNB on standby because it's the world's biggest hedge fund. And, um, you know, the the 98 crisis was what was about a hedge fund blowing up. Then 08 was about a money center bank blowing up. And there's a good argument to be had that the next crisis is one when a central bank Bank blows up. up. And I didn't even know, no one knows what that looks like, but it probably ends with the introduction of 
uh, central bank digital currency around the SDR, you know, which is Keynes. It's on Keynes's vision board, dream board, right? Yeah. <laughs> like this checks all the boxes. Um, of course, <laughs> didn't they just announce yesterday the uh, central bank coin or whatever? Oh, okay. you know, the problem is they kind of are really missing the point, right? Like the point of, of the Bitcoin is a trustless network that's just verified by all willing participants. And they want, they want basically a secured SQL server version, right? which they can, they control, but everyone can tap into. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. They're completely missing the point on. Well, I don't, or they're too clever by half they're not missing the point at all they want full control and they want to be able to see exactly what you spend your money on and be able to withhold taxes directly and things like that they want their cake and eat it too and you know you hear like anecdotal evidence of like um like walmart sales at midnight in one minute when the when the benefits cards kick in and there's this big spike in sales and it's you know baby formula and diapers mm. And like, if somebody's waiting till midnight and one minute, it's because they need this stuff, right? Yeah. So, um, and then they don't pay their employees enough that they actually qualify for those EBTs, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's just, it's cockamamie and it's just, it's frustrating. You mentioned some of these guys going astray and doing vol targeting. So I assume how you said that you think of that as a bad thing uh, uh it, yeah go dive it, into it, vol targeting for five yeah, minutes i you know i personally think the the vol of the portfolio volatility of the portfolio is like a secondary reaction right like i don't think that's like your prime directive per se i think it describes what your your portfolio is doing but i don't think it's like should be your primary directive to target that per se I will say this, um, you know, most trades don't get to like a hundred N in profitability. So there's that N concept again. Yeah. You know, we, we initially risk one N or one 20 day ATR, for example. So if you are up one N, you know, you're one to one reward to risk territory. If you're up three N on the trade, you're 3.0, you know, you're, your profitability index or your risk, re your reward to risk is three times. So if you are say three to five, most trades don't get into like 30 N in profits. Yeah. Most trades don't get into 50 N. So if you told me you took like say 20% of your um, profits off the table, converted open trade equity into realized um, equity, into realized profits, reduced risk, you know, starting at five to one, seven to one, 10 to one. I don't think that's a really, I don't think it's a bad idea. I hope you're getting out too soon because right. I hope it turns into a massive 120 N winner. Um, but face it, most trades don't get there. So but you'll have not to put words in his mouth, but I think Jerry Parker would be like, no, that's antithetical to the whole point of trend following. You got to go for those hundred ends. He says that, and then he also doesn't say that. He says, but yeah. if you want to take some <laughs> off, that's not the end of the world. Piecemeal yeah. profits, not a bad thing. I don't know. He's yeah. kind of talking about But I think that well. it's weird. Those, I guess they go in one in hand, go together. But you could also have the case if you're just purely vol targeting, that things happen outside that profit. And now you're getting out at 1.2N just because the volatility of the whole portfolio expanded and you want it to be in there at that 14 level or whatever you've targeted. Right. And now you're, now you're forced to like, you're picking winners now, right? Right. Like, right. Right. That's where the, or problem... locking in losers. Yeah. Right. And you, you like, you got out of the good thing too far too soon because this other stuff was getting ants in the, in the pants. I don't think that's a very smart idea. I do think, so I kind of look, um, I look at the overall portfolio so I, I kind of, over the years, this is what I've come up with, um, is we need to pay attention to where we are personally in the drawdown cycle is first. And you say like, if we're making new highs, I want stuff, let it rip. We're, we're doing what we should, let things go. But let's say you're, you're in a 10% drawdown or a 20% drawdown or God forbid, a 30% drawdown. You need to 
reef it in a little bit and let's say you treat 10 million like it's 8 million or even 5 million and then change nothing else but you want to reef it in by some factor like 0.8 or 0.5 or something like that to say look we're recognizing we want to be in business forever and uh we're recognizing we're in in kind of a bad state right now and we want to like reef it in to you know put in or in your main sheet right put in a couple of reefs to yeah. uh, weather the storm. So that's one aspect. Then the other aspect is where are we with, in terms of the trend index? And say, is this a good favorable time for trend or isn't it? If it is, let them rip. If it's not, maybe we should put another reef in and say, let's just bob, you know, bobble along here and wait. And then um, when the time's right, let them have it. They don't and have it. So that that's what I've been doing. It's been working good. I mean, the goal has been to um, truncate left hand losses at not a big cost to right hand returns. Yeah, that's so. The, that's the idea. I think, and then we've seen that actually in recently with some returns, right? Uh, with trends um, having such a great last year, and then getting you know gobsmacked uh, recently. Yeah, that was going to be my next thing. So, what are your thoughts on that? You just mentioned it. They came up with the new acronym, and whether coincidentally or in your case not, like huge losses for trend. Some of the biggest two, three day losses I've ever seen across some of the uh, managers we follow. Um, right, like in the seven and a half to fifteen and a half uh, range of two, three day losses, which was basically everyone was short the entire curve: twos, fives, tens, thirties, and the whole thing rallied. And, you know, they got smoked. It was too fast to get out for a lot of them. Um, so anyway, what's your thoughts on on what happened there? Is that a feature, a bug? Yeah, I mean, last year's darling was, you know, this year's heel, right? Yeah. Um, the, it, it, you had to be sure you're not a traitor. Yeah, right. Okay. And you got to take your lumps and move on or you're not doing it right. Um, now, I didn't quite see it the same way with the 40 in, 20 out project um so i think many it it let's just go back to the sock gen trend indicator which is a 20 120 day moving average crossover system what i like about that style of trade is it trades infrequently and um you know i'd rather make me money than my broker money sorry yeah. RCM, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> but like you know call it what it is like trade less make more is always a good idea um, so I do like that feature. What I don't like about those systems that are always long or short is it doesn't allow for any periods of consolidation, Yeah, you know, and you like forming a basing pattern, you know, like it doesn't really allow for that. And during those periods, it, it can get chopped up a little bit um, or whipsawed. So um, I think a lot of, if they state they're like something like 0.85 correlated to the SOC Gen CTA index, then I guess we can suppose many of the traders that are the constitute um, the constituents of the CTA indices do do a moving average crossover system. I think I think the I'm actually surprised by this, but I think the preponderance of CTA trend is in moving average systems. Yeah, which I'm floored by. Um, yeah, so it would be surprising to me as well. I, I I think um I think that's the case. Um which fine, that's all right. But they're also prone to deep drawdowns. Okay, so they had these good trades on for a long time. They're not getting out any day soon. They have these sharp reversals to it, eight percent down in a couple of days trading, right? Um, which is neither, you know, they had they had it to give from last year, right? Yeah. So, right. And that's not, the flip side of all this. If you made 30 and gave back 10. Yeah. That's kind of the bed you've slept in. That is trend volume. Yeah, right. And that's fine. Now, you compare it to like the 40 and 20 out model, it didn't have, you wouldn't even notice those two days in the return stream. They were really? just, I mean, w did it give back a lot of open trade equity? Yep. Did it get stopped out? Yep. Did it get chopped up? Yep. Yep. And yep. But you couldn't even tell from the return stream that anything was going on there that day. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that that's just 
strategy specific and i think it comes down to moving average crossover versus breakout trend following and then our last bit i'll ask you about there's been a bit of a movement to be like hey you know what all this trend following stuff cool 80 markets all these models i think we can replicate it with a simplistic model with 10 markets drives me nuts okay <laughs> drives me absolutely bonkers i and i'm not going to use names here I think we yeah. all know who we're talking about, but I just have two simple observations. The same author, um, it was, um, it, I, I remember this pretty clear. It was, it was, must've been 2013 or 14 because it was five years or so after it was five years after 08, 09 fell off the like five year return yeah. stream. Yeah. And we were at a CFA conference here in Chicago and one of the speakers said that the old school trend followers made all of their alpha, you know, we don't even know what beta is, but go ahead and say they generated alpha because we still don't know what beta is because we yeah. don't really have an index. Right. But he said that um, all their returns were derived from the yield curve sitting on like fully funded accounts and getting a five, six yeah. percent yield. And of course that was helpful, right? Like nobody, few people notionally funded accounts back then. And I guess for your listeners, you know, you can, if you have a $2 million account size, you can either put $2 million in the accounts, which would be the preferred method, or you can do like a related or uh, group account and have some master account sitting somewhere that has a pile of money in it. And then you have an account that you're trading 2 million notionally, but it really has $0 in it. And any margin requirement is, is, um, is sated by the master account. And so that's what people are doing these days. When you have a $2 million account, there's like $0 in it. Go get them, kid. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't exist anymore, um, that getting that extra 5% or 3% or one basis point kicker doesn't really exist anymore. So he said that, and I'm like, you're, you're like, you believe this. He believed it. I'm like, show me the math because that's preposterous. You're saying all these trades they're doing in silver in crude in this, you're saying none of that mattered, yeah. none of it. And that's what he said. And I'm like, I just, I, that's incorrect. That's not right. So I already kind of had a, a beef with this one author. Um, but then you go and you take a look and they've raised like a billion dollars. Yeah. In the ETF, which Billions. is great. Yeah. It's great. But on their old website, they replicate they used to replicate 16 different things. Now you go to the site, they only have but two. Mm. So yeah. they've actually done trend following of sorts by no longer offering, I imagine, the other 14 things, because they found the two things that actually worked. And if anything says trend following, it's actually that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's great, but I think people, you know, trading once a week using linear regression models, like, why don't they just subscribe to 40 and 20 out? I'll tell them exactly how, how many CTA trends should be positioned. Right? right like right. um <laughs> i can tell you minute by minute um but um I i'm not a big fan i think um i think the problem for managed futures and cta and trend is you know if i need two and a half million minimum for my trading programs um you know it'd be nice to be able to offer things in 50 and 100k clips but as you know now you're talking about a fun product and those get very yeah. expensive to administer and um, if any problem is right now with the trend, it's like, give it, give the, give the investors an investment vehicle that they can use. And so I think they filled that niche. Um, and then you see something like a 0.85, uh, risk, uh, expense ratio for those things. But what you don't see are swap fees behind the scenes and all these other additional fees, everything that is so transparent in the CTA um you know. nfa regulated space so there's a few things that drive me crazy <laughs> good um all right we've got a long time we'll leave it there 
any other thoughts um no you done i love your your show brother yeah, and you, thanks, you you do you ask you know great questions you've had a great lineup of people um yeah um all right i'm not going to tell you ask you to tell everyone where they can find you because it's plastered all over the screen there, so. <laughs> for you listeners go to the youtube subscribe for our channel and you get to see all his stuff here the quiz the linkedin the name totemasset.com uh, and we'll put all that in the show notes too all right buddy have a good one um let's grab a beer here in chicago sometime soon that's it for the pod thanks to andrew thanks to rcm for sponsoring thanks to jeff Berger for producing go check out andrew's 4020 site and trend indicator see it in the show notes go check out rcm's ranking paper rcmalts.com slash rankings and go subscribe to the pod we'll see you next week with sarah from one river peace You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.